Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming along to this panel session. As you will see, this is something of a first. We have an all-female panel session for you today, arranged by Melissa. So, and the topic that we're going to be discussing is about the future of the FDTH market and is a skill shift required to keep up with the industry. So that's what we're going to be discussing with today. I have three esteemed panellists with me and um, I'm, really, I'm going to start by just getting these guys to introduce themselves for you. So I'm actually going to start with Tamrin because I've got a brilliant link for her. And then I'm going to go on to Roisin because I've got a brilliant link for her too. So the first thing is, so Tamrin is working with um, Vorbos. For those of you who don't know the company, it's actually got some similarities with uh, the companies we were talking about earlier about, uh, it might not sound like it, but a, a community-based fibre rollout. This is a business-to-business -business rollout in London. But the big similarity is the way that uh, the company approaches hiring and retaining the staff. So yeah. introduce yourself, please. Hi everyone, I'm Tamron. Obviously I'm the training delivery lead. I have been with Borbos for about two and a half years now. So I've essentially watched them grow from a really small install team to a really large one, um, bringing in our own training facilities. Um, yeah, we are business to business and London Zone 1 and 2. Thank you very much. And so, Roisin, some of you may have heard her asking questions earlier. Now, there is a link also between Roisin and Colin's talk earlier, where he was talking about the fusion between power and telecoms. Uh, Roisin works for Corning. Corning is a company which is very old. Many of you may know it as a fibre cable supplier, but it's over 160 years old. And the first thing that Corning manufactured commercially was the light bulb housing for the first ever light bulb by Thomas Edison. It's true. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, over to you, Roisin. Uh, hello, my name is Roisin McCall. I'm a senior market and technology development manager for Corning Optical Communications, and my main specialism is in application insight research and fiber optic transmission systems. Thank you very much. And final, our final panellist, last but definitely not least, is um, Karen, who's with us from VMO2. Uh, yeah, hi everybody, nice to be here. So um, I head up all our future careers, so responsible for um, all our attraction and recruitment and development of um, anyone that we class now as future careers, um, and basically ensure that we're skilling our organisation for today and the future. So that's in a nutshell what I do. Thank you. And sorry, there is obviously a very clear tie with a number of people in the audience because there's a number of people who are on the graduate programme. Hello! <laughs> For VMO2, <laughs> who are in the audience today. OK, well, I'd like to start with um, just some pretty open questions, not particularly to do with the skill set, but it's really more to do with uh, your perspective on what's going on in the fibre industry at the moment. What would, be, what would be the three things that you would say? And Karen, I'd like to start with you. What's going on in fibre? in VMO2 perspective? Um, well, I guess from my perspective, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk generally about the future, about skills that are changing. And from this perspective where we are looking after graduates, interns and apprentices is really thinking about, okay, if we're having those changes in the future, then what new skills, where do we need to upskill, where do we need to reskill to make that difference? So our team are starting to work within the business to make sure that what those changes are required that we need to make sure that we can mm -hmm. that we can address those. I think it's a pretty exciting time at the moment as well with with how the market is changing. So um, it'd be good to see what our graduates have to say as well about their views. But um, yeah, that there's some of the things that I think is going on in the fibre industry okay, from so a, an early careers perspective. Great. So my my three words I'm going to pick up for you are various versions of skill, yes. <laughs> upskill, <laughs> reskill, skill. Yes. Yep. Excitement and change. Yes. Tamron. I mean, I've only got three words. I fully believe in there's a variety of opportunities um, and growth. So for us, it's not limited to just one role. There are quite a few different um, paths for our teams to take. Okay, so we've got opportunity, variety, and mm -hmm. growth. Yeah. Those are all pretty positive words. Rasheen? Um, I think for me on the technical side, um, it's about traffic growth which is in turn bringing opportunities for advancement in networks. It's about convergence. Uh, and so the way people are using their networks, this sort of idea of always being on. Um, and what that means is a massive rise in 
uh, data creation, data storage, data processing. Um, and I think um, tied to that is um, adoption and how we uh, encourage users to, to engage with the digital world and the always on world. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that for me is a really big deal because that's about return on investment for, for the networks that we build. Okay, so that very much seems to come back to the how do you engage people to not just buy bandwidth, but what are they buying when they get that bandwidth? Yes, yes, exactly. That's great. Okay, well, stepping back from that a little bit, I'd like to ask uh, a little on what actually inspired you to get into this industry, into the fibre in the, in the cable industry. Um, so I guess a little bit of serendipity in the sense that um, my parents told me I was going to university and they... <laughs> and, did they and, tell you what you were going to do? Yes, they did. Oh, what were you doing? <laughs> uh, I was allowed to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, possibly an architect, but they oh, didn't really agree with architects. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And of those, the most attractive option was engineering. Um, oh, okay. And it, it turns out... That that I've really enjoyed it and it's been quite a serendipitous thing, but it, I was definitely told what I was going to be doing. Um, and then once I graduated, I did a Master of Engineering in Electrical and Electronic Engineering. And fibre really attracted me because it, it seemed like a clean environment. Um, and I kind of like that more than the sort of oily machines. I oh, quite I like the idea of that. <laughs> um, and uh, again, it's been very serendipitous because I have enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you very much. Damien. Yeah. Mine was actually a really happy accident. Um, I was living in South Africa and I had been selling fiber for a US based company. And I moved to England and I applied, um, obviously I was a teacher in South Africa and I applied for a role um, at Volboss. Really didn't get the first one, which I was quite happy about initially. Um, but I was reached out um, by our recruitment lead and they were like, we have a better role for you in training. Um, we'd love you to apply. So I was like, yeah, sure. At that point, I had no idea <laughs> what I was getting into. Volboss at that point had no information online as to what they were doing. All I read was building a fiber network, <laughs> that was it. So I was like, okay, jumping in. Um, and I was quite pleasantly surprised when I started and I realized what we were doing. Um, it was obviously very quiet for a good year and a half, almost two years at that point. We launched last year and now we can actually speak about what we've done. Um, so yeah, more of a happy accident. <laughs> Very good. So was it a happy accident for you too, Karen, getting into this industry? I was going to say, there's a bit of a theme going on here. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if that's good on the panel or not. So um, for me, and I know a lot of people or young people, when you still mention the word STEM, don't necessarily know what that means. And I guess when I was ref reflecting, um, so I actually did a STEM degree and didn't realise at the time I was doing a STEM degree. I did a management uh, sciences. So I was sort of looking at that more like business studies, management side of things. Um, which I really enjoyed. I'd done, enjoyed those kind of subjects at school, but didn't really think about it. Um, and then after university, I did like a consultancy role. So I help in small to medium sized businesses um, with their training and their HR practices. And what I hadn't realized was a lot of the companies I was working with that I loved the most were in that kind of construction, engineering, manufacturing arena. Um, and then I was really attracted to Balfour BT, again, not really thinking about all these things. And then I went to Virgin Media, that's now Virgin Media 02. And what I have realised over the years is that this is an industry that I obviously keep getting really drawn to um, because of the way it is. Um, so again, coming back to that kind of exciting, that continuous improvement, that innovative kind of approach. Any organisation that has that is what pulls me and I just find these sort of industries is is what works what works for me and I've been here about 12 years now so uh, definitely definitely love this industry. That's great and uh, I, I didn't ever plan to be in the telecoms industry either but it's a funny thing um, I've worked in many of the utilities and telecoms and the one that moves the fastest is of course telecoms which does make it an exciting environment. All right so back to what I'd like to ask is what do you enjoy most about working in this industry and I'm going to put that one to Tamarin first. <laughs> 
I really like, sorry, how um, fast paced it is. I get bored quite easily. Um, I'm neurodiverse, so I really don't uh, pay attention to one thing for too long. And I've loved being able to learn everything um, and hyperfixate on things. So for me, the industry, I just love how quickly it changes, whether it's changing in splicing techniques, whether it's changing in the blowing equipment we've used. I've really been able to learn a lot that I didn't think I'd like. <laughs> so as part of your training program, is it quite hands-on? Yes, very hands-on. Um, we actually have a training facility and we provide all the training in-house at the moment. Okay, that's yeah. very exciting. Um, Karen? Yeah, similar, similar sort of answer. I think that fast-paced, um, the fact that um, there is so much opportunity to grow, I think there's always something new to learn. I think because my background is in skills and um, you know what I really love is seeing people grow in their career, especially young people. I think there's so many opportunities where apprenticeships, which is one of the areas we specialise in as, as specialise in as well as graduates, there is so much opportunity for young people to gain those technical skills. So I think we're in a really great place. And I think being honest as well, during that pandemic, I'm not gonna lie, the telecoms industry was one of the best places to be because everyone still wanted their their broadband, so uh, <laughs> not, 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 not the main reason, but uh, at that time, definitely one of the cases. Thank you. And Rasheen? Um, I think there is a lot of meat in the technical detail of networks. Um, on the transmission side, there's some real kind of physics mm -hmm. and electronics and digital signal processing, and I get a real buzz out of kind of going deep on some of that technical stuff. But then there's also that aspect of just the practicality of, of putting networks together, um, figuring out how you make products so that they work in a challenging environment. Um, so I, I just get a real buzz out of the breadth of technical problems that there are to, to deal with. And being able to bring effective solutions. Yes, yeah. I mean, clearly, if, if there were no solutions, uh, I'm not just thinking about the problems all the time. <laughs> yeah, the, the big thing is trying to figure out, okay, how do we get solutions to this? Great. Well, thank you for that. So now let's get more into the, the theme of what we're talking about. But to start with, I think the question is really, how you envisage the fibre market changing, because that's the backdrop that we need to put in place to understand what skills we're going to need. And um, I'd like to give that question to you first. Yeah. So um, I think there are a number of parts of the network, but for me, the really interesting bit is how we get fibre to everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason it's really interesting is just the sheer number of connections that have to be achieved to do that. Um, and the power that we put into people's hands when we do it. Um, and I think what that effectively means in the end is that we are going to need a lot of practical skills um, but equally, there's going to be a lot of skill set in the, the, the use of things like AI machine learning um, to run applications or receive data from all of these connections. Um, and so I think there's a wide breadth of both really hard kind of practical technical skills uh, as well as some of those more soft skills in in analytics and understanding what's coming out of these systems. So you're seeing that there's two things going on. We saw the challenges earlier of the community fibre of trying to build something up a five mile track. Yeah. So that's yeah. one of the types of things. And I suppose there's a lot of technology to do with actually the physical civil in infrastructure laying that's going on at the moment with micro digging, which you must have to do a lot of <laughs> yeah. in London. Yeah. So there's that physical side of it. There's obviously the, the advances in technology, silicon, lasers, fibre, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. Yeah, we sort of see quite a convergence. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think about Coherent Pon, looks like a really old school CATV network with a QAM and put in bandwidth, but it's all in optical. If you look at modern systems and even sort of if you look at uh, intensity modulated direct detect systems that are used in Pon today, 
as they get up to 50 and 100 gig, those are going to need DSP. So you take in the optical domain and you're starting to pull it into electronics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. digital signal processing. So, so there's quite a lot of stuff that's kind of merging. It's and that fusion of network and IT again, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. it's not necessarily possible to be just an electronic engineer or mm -hmm. just an optics engineer or just the civil engineer. You've got to be able to understand... Much wider skills base. Yeah, mm -hmm. aspects of the crossovers. Great, thank you. Karen? T to be honest, from a, from a technical point of view, it's difficult for me to answer, but I agree with everything Machine's saying around that um, that skills base piece, that we're really seeing that, that where people, I guess, had more of those like traditional roles, you're now sort of facing into people needing to be much more multi-skilled in, in their roles because of the changes and people needing to adapt more in the way that the future is, is going in fibre. So that's probably one of the key things I would I would say, you know, obviously from a technical point of view, it was great to hear what you've just talked about, but it really resonated, I guess, from a more general point of view around that issue is probably across everywhere around those skills that we need mm -hmm. to start thinking about for the future. But I suppose there's other parts to what will happen over the next five years. There's the um, obviously starting and a, will be an accelerated trend of consolidation. And that's going to bring organisational challenges, I imagine. Yeah, um, you know, we're seeing that across VMO2 where they're sort of looking around um, that consolidation. We're going through a transformation journey at the moment. Um, and it really is looking around what those skills are that are needed today and in the future. But it's, that's what makes it a really exciting time as well, because it's looking at, you know, where can we potentially reskill people that are in roles that are perhaps not so much needed anymore. Um, looking at bringing people in with new skills and uh, from a diversity perspective, um, but also looking to upskill people where they perhaps need to expand some of their knowledge. So there is lots of lots of change, both in a technical skill point of view, but also. Um, I guess the general general skill point of view. So yeah, lots lots of change coming at BMO too. Mm. And the sort of thing that was also discussed today, which is about, it's not just getting a fibre network. It's what you can deploy over the top of it. That must be something that you're looking to at uh, Borbos as well. I mean, yeah, to an extent. Um, we've obviously built a network with um, hundreds of kilometres of fibre and thousands of chambers. So we, we built that and now we're looking at the next step, which is obviously connecting buildings, looking at pre-connections, ensuring that buildings that are coming up, because obviously London is growing, we're making sure that we can provide that service from day one. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room has ever struggled with getting internet in their homes. It takes months. Internet to businesses can take ages. You're stuck in extremely long contracts. Um, and a lot of the times the network is not really looking at the future and what you would need in three years time it's kind of looking at what you would need right now um, a lot of the networks that you'd be purchasing would be three-year contracts and the internet bandwidth that you'd be getting will last you for this year but it won't necessarily be great for next year which means that you have to pay more next year um, we kind of have a different way of looking at it we're planning for the future we are forward thinking so what we're giving our customers now are really for ambitious customers. So it's people that are doing um, obviously AI and quantum computing. It's people that are looking uh, a few years down the line to have that um, level of bandwidth and not necessarily people who need it on like day-to-day -day mm -hmm. instances. So that's why we're very focused on businesses and um, our targets are slightly different to the general network. I suppose it's a slightly left field question, but one of the lasting impacts of COVID and lockdown is the amount of people that are business users, but they're working from home. Yeah. Is that something you're factoring into your um, to business an extent, Yeah, definitely to an extent. Um, we are still looking at stats around how many people are coming into London. Um, obviously, there are still millions of people traveling into London every day. So I don't think that that is a huge concern for us because whether they're coming in three days a week, one day a week, they're still coming in regardless and they still need that bandwidth. So whether we're connected to the um, local we work or whether we're connected to a bigger you know smart spaces places like that they still need bandwidth so for us it's to be able to provide that bandwidth for them okay thank you so um the second question i've got for the panel today is about uh a change that will happen over the next five years as the networks pivot the, the operators pivot from this rapid expansion that's going on into more of an operational mode 
What sort of things do you think are the core skills that are going to be necessary going forwards? And I'd like to put that one to Karen first. Um, so I think there's obviously lots of skills that are talked about at the moment. You're hearing lots about AI, for example, digital skills broadly. I think uh, Virgin Media 2 is a lot of talk around automation, um, lots of talks around kind of software defined networks. So there's a lot more, a lot more increasing talks around that. And so um, we're looking at, well, starting to look at how we can use that from a future careers point of view. So um, in one of my roles as leading an apprenticeships, there's um, trailblazer groups that you can get involved in. So looking at um, automation based apprenticeships to see whether that is something that could be used because apprenticeships for any age now, whether that's, again, people coming in at an earlier age or people being reskilled in that. I think what we're also seeing is, um, I guess, that increasing need from a soft skill side. So the way we um, hire is very much on potential. So um, I lead on the team that's more focused on potential rather than previous experience. And that growth mindset is increasingly being talked about. So um, because things are changing and skills are changing, then we're looking for people that actually have want that desire for that new technical understanding, that new knowledge that new experience and we're also looking for that for in our internal employees because we, we know that some people will need to upskill um, and reskill. So we talk a lot around learning agility, problem solving, that analytical skill base because our view is well if someone's got that broad spectrum of skills then actually the knowledge we can teach whether it's formally or via people that are already in the business. But they're some of the things that are being talked about most promptly at the moment in the business. I mean, that's very interesting talking about, because there's a big focus on, is it university education that's needed by everybody? But you're not just talking about apprenticeship as an, an option for a straight out of school, um, school leaver. You're talking about at any age. Yes, we have. I mean, 50% of our apprentices are actually the, over the age of 25. So we've seen a real shift in the last couple of years. And I think that's been influenced by the pandemic. So we did some research that found that 50% um, of everyone that was surveyed actually would retrain um, if they had um, the cost paid for and they had the time. So we're finding that increasingly from a hiring perspective, we're getting um, a slightly um, older type of individual rather than a pure young, young adult. And it's making a difference because our salaries are pretty, pretty good. And um, to be honest, for an apprenticeship, it's not your typical minimum minimum wage salaries. Um, but we are also using our apprenticeships probably for the last six, about six years, where we are using it to upskill, whether that's in a soft skill such as coaching for technical people, um, or a technical skill such as network engineering. So it's really broadened um, our offering, and we want it to be as inclusive as possible and that's why it's head of future careers not early careers anymore because it's no longer just early it's more new and revised careers now that's, um, that's very interesting yeah not everybody not everybody can afford to go to university um, so again by uh, having the options open of graduates or apprentices then you're actually just widening that participation because there's a lot of people who just simply can't afford to go to university they may get the good you know physics maths whatever it might be a levels but we're finding that they um, can't afford to necessarily go or they just realise that academic side isn't for them but we also find people with degrees also then sometimes go into the apprenticeship because they realise that some of those skills they've actually learned at university become out of they're almost like they've lost that skill set by the time they've got a university the technology's moved on so so for us it is about as many different types of programmes that are strategically possible to line up with those skills of the future. Great thanks. So Tamron, how about yourself? I mean, you're also a network operator, and yeah. are you are you finding that as you get more um, customers on board, you're having to change the blend of skills inside the company? Yeah, absolutely. So as we realized we launched, prior to our launch, what we had started doing is we adapted our training facility so that we included um, almost the markup of a customer's building. So we had risers installed, we have um, a mock data center and a mock um, customer I've lost the word right now, <laughs> but obviously the customer's um, connection room. So we have a whole training facility that essentially connects our um, mini network, which is essentially a platform with open reach chambers, uh, just that we can tra train PIA, which connects up into our customer room essentially. So our teams can learn how to remove um, ceiling tiles, remove the floors, 
So that is one way we've changed in terms of training. We were able to train, uh, I think, almost 100 installation technicians in this. Um, and a lot of their training then afterwards, where they went out into the field, started doing customer connections with some of our experienced teams. And then they would come back and retrain. And then they would go back out and then start training others. So we've really had that sharing of skills, which has been quite incredible to see. But on the other side, we're quite fortunate to receive um, up to two and a half thousand pounds per year um, on top of our salary to use towards any kind of training that we'd like. Okay. So whether it was personal development, whether it was career development, we have that um, ability to be able to use additional money, not our own, to study. Um, so I, for one, did a course through Harvard Business School. We've had people that have done oh, a bunch of really cool courses. <laughs> um, so like leadership courses, when it comes to telecoms courses, we don't make anybody pay. Um, if it's role specific, a lot of the times it'll come out of their, um, their employee budget, which um, everybody still has that training budget. But we provide that for additional skills. We've had a lot of engineers do courses in um, coding and software engineering. So they're learning a different skill. Yeah, we're, we're just really quite um, encouraging when it comes to skills. We have a library which we mix between um, telecoms books to self-help books to um, women empowerment books. We have a ton of different opportunities to learn. Okay, so it sounds like it's about education, education, uh, and education. <laughs> um, I see you. Now, listen, I'm I'm yeah. not I'm not looking to get covered in glitter either. So that was totally blatant up Gary Starmer, all right? So let's, let's keep that one back. Yeah, our CEO actually, when we decided to change um, the business proposition um, and decided to go into an ISP, um, he had, was like, "Well, if we're going to build a network, the first thing we're doing is building a school." And that was his first thought. Was that's that's very good. Um, I'm not sure where the barn people are, but I read the quote with interest. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> I read the quote that you had with interest, which was was it Thomas Franklin? No, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, of course, silly me. <laughs> the one about the end is if you want to know how to do something, then uh, you know. You learn. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah, we've had some incredible ones. Um, a lot of our teams will go out and look for innovative ways to do different things in the field, look at, you know, how we can do a job safer. Um, how, oh, how so very much a sort of Kaizen, continuous improvement. Yeah, continuous learning is yeah. important to us, like okay. extremely important. And perhaps slightly more on the technology side, what do you see? Well, I completely un uh, agree with Karen on the whole problem solving. I mean, as these networks get rolled out, there will be problems right there are going to be problems um and so that problem solving skills etc is is really important but what i would say as I mean, i've been in this industry a bit longer than i care to admit and um there 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 are various parts of the network so you've got you know you've got your submarine you've got your long haul you've got your data centers and metro and access and what tends to happen is those parts of the network go through refreshes in waves. Mm -hmm. So right now, the um, past couple of years, it's been submarine that is going through a big refresh. Um, what are the key things happening in submarine? So in submarine, the big, the big pinch point is traffic. Mm -hmm. So the traffic is growing. It's, it's about 30% CAGA which means that the traffic's doubling every three years, essentially. Um, but those submarine networks, they're like 24, 48 fibers mm -hmm. in those cables. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's been a real pressure on either making new routes, making new resilient routes, or increasing SNR across the transmission <coughs> system using wider bandwidths using CNL bands. So that's been happening because of the the real the real pressure on submarine networks and they're even now talking about using multicore fiber in order to uh, in order to increase that capacity because they're hitting the limits of what they can do with signal to noise and bandwidth and modulation schemes. But then you also see the access networks. Obviously, we're all here in the UK. We know that there's this massive push out into the networks. If you look at France and Spain, they are both talking about copper switch off. 
Now, I, I don't know whether I should say that out loud in a room with all these people from the uh, CATV business, but, but that in, in France and Spain, that is a serious conversation right now. They're going to switch the copper off, right? So um, in the UK, we are nowhere near that. Um, but those the people that are building the network today, they're going to be the ones that are building the, the fibre out to, to directly into homes, maybe fibre to their room um, in the future. So from a technology perspective, I don't see these waves ending anytime soon. Okay. Well, um, yes, so the core skills are just going to be continuous evolving with the yeah. changes in the technologies that roll through. Yes. Yes, I mean, my son doesn't want to have anything to do with what I do for a living. <laughs> but, I mean, if I, if I had any influence on what he did for a living, I'd be telling him to go into the fibre business. Well, there we go. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good. So, I'm going, to, I'm going to change direction a little bit here. As we are a, a women panel, women only panel, I'm now going to move to, as, as we all know, this is a largely male-dominated industry, <laughs> as many of the STEM ones are. Um, so I'd like to ask what strategies uh, your three companies can employ to get more women and more diversity, not just women, diversity into the workforce. And I'd like to start this with Tamarin. And I'm going to start with Tamarin because um, you might not know, but her company has got 40% women work in the company, which is something of a record, I think, in this Not industry. Not just in the company, in the installation team. So in the installation our actual team. field engineers are up to almost 40% um, female. Um, and how have you managed that? How have you managed that track to those I people always, in? I leave it down to quite a lot of different things. The main one would be benefits. Uh, obviously, our benefits are targeted towards both male and female. So we have things um, like the budget, the, the learning budget's a huge one. Another one is period days. I know periods are really not the greatest thing to talk about, but it's something that is a reality when you're working in the streets. It's not very comfortable. Um, care days and personal days. So it doesn't matter. We don't ask questions, but if you need some time, we can take it. So for us, it's ensuring that our employees have the time to take when they need it. Um, and then the other side is like our benefits are quite vast. So we all have private medical insurance. We have... Um, Oh, I'm trying to think about all the benefits that we have. We um, bring in things like um, feedback days. So we have feedback forms that our installation teams can fill in. One of the feed, one of the bits of feedback that we received is finding a bathroom in the, in central London in dirty clothes is not easy. <laughs> really difficult. I don't know if anybody's ever tried this, but well, when you can't even go into a Starbucks. No, oh, okay. we've had some, without buying something, obviously. So all of our <laughs> employees have um, company cards that they can um, take to any kind of prints or wherever they want, really. And if they need to buy something to be able to go to the restroom, they can. So one of the reasons we thought, let's minimize it slightly, we have welfare vans. And one of our installation technicians helped us with the design and, you know, the implementation of these welfare vans. And essentially what it is, is a mini kitchen and a bathroom and a bunch of snacks on wheels um, that drive through London zone one and two. And they go and they stop at all the teams and they drop off things like, I mean, all the snacks, all the energy bars you could think of. They, they have them on board, um, hot drinks, cold drinks, microwaves, um, and then obviously the bathroom. And all of our welfare officers are mental health trained. So they're there as like our eyes and ears to hear if there's anything else in the streets or um, within the teams that we need to be able to support with. And it's actually been a really different way to view it because they've really been able to give our teams that connection back to the head office. Because a lot of the times our teams don't necessarily come into the main office all the time. It also but gives that's them... a direct feedback from the crews. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that was direct feedback. Another one, which was really random, but um, one of our teams had said, well, we can't drive our vans into basements in central London because they're too tall because of the, the warning lights on top of the vans. So what we had done at that time is we had gone and gotten um, shorter lights for the top of our vans to make them the right heights so that they can get into any building in London, which minimizes the time for us to have to stop by the nearest door to take all the equipment out so then walk into the building and then go and park the car somewhere else. We don't have to do that anymore. Our vans fit in every building, which is, I think, really cool. Well, that sounds like another instance of your continuous learning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was quite fun. Great. But yeah. 
Um, well, I mean, that all sounds tremendously positive, I yeah. have to say. Making it easy. Do you get a lot of, do the field technicians, your field crews, do they get a lot of pushback when someone say it's a woman bringing it in or is that not a thing? Oh, that isn't a huge thing. That's actually, I was going to tell you about that later. Um, huge. Yeah. We um, often have comments, whether it's um, racist comments, whether it's sexist comments, they our teams have dealt with it all. I'm in HR at the moment, so I hear a lot of it. Um, but yeah, we, we really deal with a lot of pushback from people, which it's a man's job. It's not a woman's job. I don't know why is there a woman. Um, a lot of the times we've had, why is there an apprentice doing this? Um, why is it not a trained technician? Um, so we've had a lot of that pushback. Uh, and obviously in the field in central London, it's quite dangerous for women to be out on their own in the streets. So what we've done is we partnered with the Met Police. Um, they came in and they gave us a discussion around um, keeping safe in these areas. We mm -hmm. also had um, uh, a gentleman from one of the homeless shelters in our area to come in and discuss what to do when our teams encounter people that are homeless and are potentially aggressive um, and what to do in those situations and how to refer them to the right places. So we have that, and if there's any loan working with any um, female installation technician, um, everybody, regardless, and even our networks team, all have to wear um, loan working bands. Mm -hmm. So anytime if any of the bands stop tracking their movements, oh, it signals, the immediate alert. we have an immediate alert. So um, that just helps us keep our team safe, because we do have a few women working at nights too. Thank you very much. Yeah. Karen, over to you. I love those ideas, by the way. That's yeah, they're great. Like write that. them down. I know, I'll be keen write them down. So uh, pass them back. So, um, yeah, I guess from a slightly different angle. So with the focus, um, specifically what we do on future careers, I guess um, we're looking at lots of different points to attract females um, into this industry. So really looking all the way before they're even at that point where they're making those education choices. So. We, one of the things we've done that actually linking a bit to what I was saying around didn't even know I was doing STEM and realising I, I like this kind of industry is we um, created a few years ago what we called a match me tour. So you can fill it in and it'll be um, simple questions, about four or five questions. Do you like working in outside? Do you like working in an office type environment? Um, do you like working with numbers? Those kind of questions. And the idea is that you fill it in and it's geared for people that maybe don't know what they want to do or they do and they just want to take that that test and then what comes out is um, basically a list we've made it that there's always something that somebody will see and um, where it'll come up with a list for example of apprenticeships that might suit them so what we found is from a female perspective is they're filling it in and maybe might assume for example oh marketing or whatever mm -hmm. it might be and actually roles such as field technician mm -hmm. network engineering cyber security those kind of roles are now coming out so we've had direct feedback saying it's actually opened up their minds. So where you might not have asked for it, might not have thought of it, if it's exactly presented that. back, then people are willing to take that yeah. step. And I think that's partly this change around skills-based organisations linking to that, because I think people can get quite hung up by a title, either I don't even know what network engineering means, I won't think about it, or oh, that doesn't sound like something for me, or that's the job for the boys, whatever that reason might be. So actually by them answering questions about themselves, and then it coming up, it makes them at least reflect on it, um, and then look into that role a little bit further. So that's one of the things that we've been doing as a, as a kind of basic step to kind of for everybody. Um, and who, do, who, do, who gets access to that? Um... It's just on our website, so anyone, oh, okay. anyone can go onto it. You could all have a go after this, see, see what it comes up about yourself. Um, but yeah, it's available, so we, we do that. Um, we also, um, I guess from a recruitment perspective, we know that um, females don't tend to apply to roles as much when there's like bullets around um, criteria for roles because we're hiring on potential. We don't try and put any bullet points in. We don't ask for previous experience. We do blind um, recruitment. We don't ask for CVs. So we really try and open it up as much as possible. Um, and because we found from our research that females, um, and also from an ethnic minority, global majority, we call it at BMO2, um, tend to be a little bit less confident um, in recruitment processes. We've actually built coaching calls into our process. So before they go for an assessment centre, they know exactly what to expect. They can ask lots of questions. Um, and we find that our, our dropout rates um, for assessment centres has literally gone down to almost 0% because we're, we're finding that. So what we found is that when we get females actually entering um, the application process, we're actually getting that same number 
at the end, whereas before we might have had that drop off as we'd gone as we'd gone through. Now, I'm taking a note on that one because I think that idea of doing coaching before people go to an interview is an absolutely great one. My daughter's just been going for her interviews at university for a year in industry and she's terrified of it because she's never done it. So I think that's a yeah, really good idea. It, it, makes a lot, it makes a lot of difference. We've really noticed it and, and selfishly it's good for us because if they don't come to the coaching call, we think actually, are they actually going to turn up to that assessment centre? So it's a good way for us to um, see if people are committed. Um, to those roles. We also, um, in conjunction with that, again, a bit like the Match Me tool, we do what we call practice situational judgment tests. So again, we go into schools, we have that available on our website. So if people want to experience one of the stages of our assessment centre process, um, they can do that up front. So again, whether it's for us, we're trying to do a greater societal good piece as well, that they can have that practice. Um, Because about a third of employers use that type of psychometric approach. We also, this year launched a STEM Insight Week. So we partnered with the Engineering Development Trust to basically encourage um, 14 to 16 year olds. So we know that critical age is about 11, I think typically. Um, but we've gone in from a 14 to 16 year old range and we invited 200 students virtually to attend um, a STEM week. So we had um, directs in our business, alumni, grads and apprentices, on program grads and apprentices, basically talking about um, different ways in technology, either what experience as a graduate or here's a piece of technology that's coming, let me talk to you about that. And um, what was great to see was um, we actually had 50% of females join that um, Insight Week and we had 76% from a global majority join. So we thought actually that appetite is there. Mm -hmm. Um, But research says that before you leave school, you only get 14 minutes of career advice when you're at school. So even if you were interested in STEM, the chance of somebody even talking to you about that is very slim. So we've introduced this work experience um, week to really engage with people, get people excited. And the way we do it at VMO2 is, and for a lot of our things, even on programme is, is to actually have our graduates um, and apprentices and our interns present some of this. So we can have like senior more people. Relatable. More relatable. More mm-hmm. relatable. So we find that really lands. They feel more comfortable asking those questions. They're saying it live from just coming out of school or university themselves. So it's just more realistic in that language, the work that they would be that they would be doing. And we found that um, after that, we, they, did, they did some projects. They had some um, recruitment sessions with our team. They had the technology sessions. Um, but that increase in terms of wanting to consider or go into STEM increased to about 80% Um, and then they're also their interest in Virgin Medro too because again from our brand perspective not everyone always understands what we do from a a, a technology point of view they might think of engineering like a Rolls Royce rather than perhaps um, a VMO2 or we're competing with like the Googles and the Amazons so we're kind of caught in this kind of mix with our, our brand or humanities students we get a lot of so we've tried to do a lot of different things um like that um, and then obviously we also have our um, apprenticeship programs um, and our graduate programs and the reason the apprenticeship programs work is you've got less than about 20 percent of university students coming out of a stem degree and you're also competing with the pwcs of this world with the physics degrees for example for consultancy roles so we find by having a really strong mix of apprentice schemes and graduate programs and internship programs that um, like I said before, you're appealing to lots of different people, but also you're just widening, widening um, your catchment, yeah. widening that pool and the language that we're using. And for those females that perhaps decided not to do for whatever reason the A levels, that then meant they can't even go to university. We're then targeting, um, we target females at specific STEM based events. So we'll go into specific STEM based university events, or we'll go into schools that have got a particularly high number of females. Or from a global majority point of view, they're they're the schools that we particularly target to really try and spread the words from that's a, that's from a that's great. Thank you. Sounds very comprehensive. So Rasheen, over to you. I think um, I don't want to repeat what's been said about the entrance into the pipeline. Clearly, we need to get more uh, more girls doing STEM subjects and get them into the pipeline. Um, and the Fibre to the Home Council are doing 
um, a little bit of work with with videos and having materials that can be played within schools and that sort of thing. Oh, that's one of the FTTH Council initiatives. Yes. Is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but um, one of the things I'd like to talk about is the leaky pipeline. Mm-hmm. So once women get into the industry, are they staying? Are they receiving the opportunities? Are they getting into the boards, into the leadership teams? Because, um, because you know, girls are not going to be interested in joining a community where there are no female leaders right so we can do as much as we can on getting people into the pipeline but if they don't see a way of progressing but if five years Mm. in they're looking at no progression then they're not going to stay um and so getting people into the pipeline is really critical but making sure that pipeline isn't leaky some of the biggest things for women is clearly you know we have kids I don't make any apologies for that. If we didn't have kids, we'd all be in trouble. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe we want to spend a year at home with our babies, but maybe we'd like to know that we can afford to eat during that year and also have a job at the end of it. Maybe um, maybe we, we want to get straight back to work, but we need a bit of extra flexibility. Mm-hmm. Maybe we're gonna take a five year career break and when our kids go to school, then we'll go back into the industry. And we want to know there are ways and means of doing that. And right now, I have to say, I don't see that many women in leadership teams. I don't see that many women on boards. We did a survey for the Fibre to the Home Council Europe and what we discovered just from the responses to our survey was that men who work for men are as likely as the average to receive, just slightly more than average to receive training. Women who work for men are significantly less likely than average to reach training and anybody working for a woman is significantly more likely to receive training so (laughs) and that's is that because is that because women don't ask or is it because they're not offered we didn't you the statistics wouldn't allow me to speculate on why Mm -hmm. that is but what the statistics do tell me is that um women women are facing a barrier to opportunity and training during their careers. And what that does is it has a knock-on effect on where they, how quickly and how far their careers progress. Mm-hmm. Um, so definitely, definitely everything that's been said about getting people into the pipeline, I fully support that, but, but my my call to the industry is you know hey once once women are in the pipeline just you know they should be receiving the same opportunities and and we don't want to lose them so many of the initiatives that uh, you were talking about tamarin which are to do with making it easier for people to work on a day-to-day basis perhaps those policies need to be extended to enable people to come back to work Mm -hmm. that um if they've had to take a break for some reason whatever it may be I definitely think that we've had a few uh, maternity leaves, um, quite a few paternity and um, the maternity leaves, they all come back. Um, our CPO, our Chief People Officer, um, she returned about a month or so ago uh, after almost a year on maternity leave and was able to just jump straight back in and carry on. She still held her um, position as significantly as she had prior to her Well, that's, that's very good to hear because... Um It'd probably be the experience of any woman above a certain age in this uh, this room okay. that we will all have known someone who's gone away on maternity leave and found their job disappeared. Yeah. That happens all the time. Yeah. Happened to me. Yeah. Or gets pregnant and it is, it, you know, is working for somebody who doesn't want you pregnant on their time. Yes, that's right. We've also found, um, we've run... Um, 
a number of women returner programmes, specifically in that technology space, and not necessarily because people have gone on maternity leave, but for whatever reason. And we find they've been a really great way to bring people in, almost like you say, inject to that leadership level, because where we are working at early careers level, it's obviously an investment to get people to that leadership side. And it is interesting what you're saying, because where that leaky pipeline starts, because we find that um, the graduates and apprentices we bring in, in terms of retention, there is no shift between females and males. It's obviously still in that earlier stages yeah. than before they get into leaders. But there is definitely a point when something um, changes because we see no difference. Because when you think about, and it's something to think about when you start on an apprentice or graduate programme the way we do it, is everyone starts on the same salary, so it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, you have the same salary, you have the same progression. When you land, you're pretty much on the same salary. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain point when that starts shifting, when you then start getting all the gender pay gap and ethnic minority, you know, pay gap yeah. reviews and all those kind of pieces where it we comes in. We saw that in the Fibre to the Home Council survey, we saw precisely that. So at the early stages, at 10 years of less than 10 years, it's pretty equal. Mm -hmm. um, but by the time you get at 10 years past 10 years, so at 20 years, what you discover, and I don't know how many people are in this room, but for a hundred people, a um, hundred leaders um, at sort of te a technical conference or a leadership conference, there are 12 women missing and mm -hmm. they're missing in action. They should be there, but they're, just, but they're not. Um, and that happens at those really, those higher levels, at those longer levels of tenure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to, I'm going to change the direction slightly now. <laughs> I'm going to go back to more um, what's going to happen to people in the workplace with response to new technology. So this really is a question about, in, in your view, I'm going to start with you, Rasheen, um, what do you think the emergence of AI, we've heard it talked about a bit today, and also automation, what's that going to do to reduce or reshape the demand for humans? Do you think it will reduce, or what do you think are going to be the changes that are brought online with these, the introduction of more AI and automation? I think one of the things that AI and machine learning is going to do is it's not just going to take more data and produce more data, um, but it, it's going to require more analysts i think now of course you could say well hang on ai machine learning is about making decisions so you don't need analysts but in actual fact i think it's just going to expand the number of things that people look at so you know we heard this this morning from colin about you know all these layers of data and we've got more data so we're using more data and that it's, it, it seems to be um, a feature of the world that we live in is the more data we get, the more data we use. Um, and so I'm pretty confident in the future. I don't see a dystopian future in which the machines take over, if I'm absolutely honest. I have to say I agree with you. I think that AI and automation will accelerate what we can do and they will expand the possibilities and yeah. people move in to fill those possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, over to you, Tammy. <laughs> I definitely don't think it would be able to take away the human factor and what humans actually do for the market. I think we could definitely utilise AI within the industry, um, whether it's just finding an answer to something, but I... Yeah, I don't see it taking over the role that our teams do. You know, there's I don't foresee buildings allowing um, like robots to go into their buildings to install their fiber, for instance. Um, and that's like very long term in the future. For right now, I don't think it would take um, the physical structure. Do you think it will help with your training? Yeah, definitely. We actually had um, a, there was a really funny hackathon. So one of our, our systems team. Um, what they do is they love to um, take two days off every couple of months and basically just innovate different ways to build software systems. Um, and one of um, our teams built a, a virtual reality training course. So basically he had a VR headset and he was essentially unplugging and replugging things in a data center. 
Um, he didn't end up with his head down under the table. <laughs> no, 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 so. nothing. Sorry, no. But I mean, and he won actually. It was oh, really good. good. Um, and so, in that sense, yes, it could definitely help us. But yeah, I definitely don't think it could affect us too much. Okay. Yeah. How about you, Karen? I think it's both probably in a way. I think it is reshaping and consolidating. At VMO2, we're definitely talking a lot more about becoming digital first. So I think there's, I think it's that mindset shift with some of it to your point that I don't think it's going to replace humans but the way people are just thinking about things is just very different now and how we're going to use it and even just not in, not in a fibre example but even in our recruitment the way our AI is coming for example is meaning we're now having to change the way that we are going to have to do our assessments of candidates because they'll be able to use AI to get through that stage of the process more easily mm-hmm. and how do we ensure that that has been a real answer that's been given so it's just making you problem solve and all those kind of pieces that we've talked about before and go, how do we make a shift um, in this space? So it's defi- definitely going to reshape and there'll be, I think, some level of consolidation naturally with automation, but perhaps not to a full extent. Well, I think that was a, that was a nice positive message from the panel. <laughs> We're all still going to have a job. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Okay, and on to, a, on to another slightly technical question, which is, um, this has got technical, commercial, management issues about it, but as technology such as Internet of Things becomes uh, a much more prevalent part of our lives, um, what do you think this is going to have an effect on the industry, on the network, on the capacity, on uh, everything to do with um, fibre? Over to you, Rasheen. Um, I think what, what will happen with the Internet of Things is that... Um, People more generally, and I think we heard about the cattle tracking and um, some fairly surprising things that you might think actually real practical uses of uh, internet things, of 5G. Um, I think people are going to see that more and more and having sensors within our environment is going to be more and more important whether that's a sort of future in which we've got autonomous cars or or any of that, um, I think we will be using environmental sensors a, a great deal more. Now, what that effectively means in the architecture is more leaf points. More leaf points means that those leaf points need to come back into a branch network. So even if those leaf points are being connected by 5G, the 5G mobile network is an incredibly wired network, right? There's a lot of fiber in those networks. Um, And so you're gonna see branches coming back. Now, the aggregation of those branches, when you're looking at networks, it's quite an optimization to decide where to aggregate all those branches back into say a trunk Mm -hmm. because um, whilst the use of aggregation means you need to use less fibre as you're coming back through the network fibre is an inherently passive um, system medium right Mm -hmm. so um, and and so you there's a there's a real optimization between how much power do you want to put into the network and how much passive are you prepared to put in the network to avoid the power? Um, and so I, I see a lot of fibre in the network. Um, in a past life, I used to work in physics and astronomy, and we used to, uh, in, on greenfield sites, we were building radio telescopes and connecting them up with fibre. We used to do techno-economics of going for loads of fiber fiber rich but maybe slow speeds versus high speed but fiber um sparse and the techno economics every single time used to come out in favor of fiber um just because of the power um and the expense of the electronics to put power out into the network so i see a very a lot of silica in the ground okay personally i mean there's one concern i suppose which has if we have the internet things and our houses are all wired up how on earth are we going to ensure the security yeah security is is another really big deal and operators are going to have to think about that very very carefully 
Um, and I think homeowners will also need to be educated, you know, very carefully that's right. about I mean, how that's working within that home environment. It's bad enough trying to educate people on how to manage their kids not accessing things they should do, but this is really about stopping other people accessing things that they really shouldn't in your house. Yes, yeah. and it, but it's also a question of functionality. Mm -hmm. You know, do we really want the fridge to have a camera on it? Well, I don't know whether I need a fridge with a camera on it. How many um, people have got a fridge with a camera on it? <laughs> it's got, yes, <laughs> we've got one. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, the, the, having, having intelligent devices in our homes is one thing, but they should really only be doing the things they need to do. I would agree with that. Yeah. Tamron, over to you. <laughs> so obviously companies will have to adapt to the exponential um, growth in capacity demand. Um, and a provision is obviously is a historical problem um, re with retrofitting becoming um, extremely extremely expensive sorry um so obviously i feel that the few the the industry will have to become a lot, a lot more future facing looking at um laying a network that will last us decades and not just years um obviously we haven't had this and we're seeing a lot of breaks and errors in the current network that's out there so i definitely think building smarter would um be a lot more beneficial to companies. Well, the Internet of Things won't be much use unless the networks are resilient. This is, yeah, making sure we get resilient networks. So, yeah. Yeah. And Karen? I think something just from a side different angle, and just from the examples you gave, Rasheen, is around that bit around thinking about those green skills that mm -hmm. link in. I feel like we talk a lot about um, some of the skills and some of these technologies and the way we work, and actually how, with all these things around, like cameras in fridges and all these things, how does this all play from a sustainability point of view? Um, so it's definitely something that I think is also worth considering with some of the points that we've talked about already. Thank you. Well, with that, I'm now going to ask um, all the members of the panel to come together with an end point. So I'd like to really talk through if there's one actionable takeaway you would like everyone in the audience to take from this uh, today, what's the advice that you would like to share? And Karen, I'd like to start with you. Okay. Um, so I think for me, because of all the things we've talked about and everything changing is really thinking about what we know and what we can trust going forward. So really thinking about if we really want a diverse workforce, if we really want those new or revised skills in the future to really think about either people we haven't yet hired or people we have hired and really think about their potential rather than their previous um, skills and experience because I think that's what's going to be needed to really make that shift that you get those people that have got that really strong growth mindset to make a difference and then training them on the job later on. Because not everybody comes to wanting to work in a structured way at the same time in life. Great. Yeah. Tamron? I definitely think being open-minded and um, listening to feedback, uh, listening to your staff, your employees, um, the people that actually do the job on the daily basis, listening to them. Um, I know a lot of the times it's extremely easy to sit at our desks and make decisions that impact other people's work. However, it's not your work, it is their works. Yes, you know um, as much as you can, but you don't know what they go through on a daily basis. And I think we've really learned this by listening to our, our teams in the field, whether it's the teams in the field, whether the teams in the data centers, um, everybody has a voice and being able to listen and adapt and work together to find um, solid solutions is I think highly important for everybody. So it's that continuous feedback loop, yeah. everybody's voices. I heard, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, great. And Rishi? Um, I think there are a myriad of studies that demonstrate that diversity in teams increases the uh, performance of those teams. It allows them to make better and more resilient decisions. It's not always easy to work in a team that's diverse because it's a lot easier to work in a team where everybody thinks the same as you do. But uh, those teams tend to... Um, go down a group think and so there's no doubt diversity is important I think for the audience if you are working in an organization and you look around the room and everybody looks the same as you do then um, it's it's worth taking a moment to think is there somebody in my team who I can give an opportunity to show that they can do this job is there somebody in my team who I can give get on the training course so that they have the skills to do this job? 
Um, and I, d I do genuinely think that it's on all of us and it's to the benefit of all of us um, to do that. And, and if we continue to offer diverse staff members um, opportunities and skills, we're going to get to the point where all of the teams we're involved with are making really solid, resilient um, solid and resilient decisions. And by the way, investors are looking at that. Right? Investors are looking who is on your board. You know, is that a diverse board? Because I don't want to invest in a company that isn't making resilient decisions. And I suppose along with encouraging that diversity, it's even if you have it in the team, ensure that everybody, again, everyone's mm -hmm. voice is heard, yeah. that people don't feel squished, because we all know about the studies that show people will try and bend to peer pressure. Mm -hmm. Encourage them not to, I suppose, is the message from that. Yeah, I, I heard a really interesting story, and I think there was a TV series called The Shield, I think it was called, it was an American TV mm -hmm. series, and um, the director noticed there were two women on the script writing team and they did not speak. And he said, why aren't you speaking? And they said, because every time we speak, the, our male colleagues talk over the top of us, shoot us down or ignore us. So we just don't bother. Um, and this guy heard this and, and the next time he said, I really want you to speak up, they spoke up and he saw what they were seeing. And he instigated these script writing meetings with no interruptions. So everybody got a say, right? And that's when the women in that script writing team were much more able to contribute. Um, and so it's just being aware that of the dynamics of, of what might be happening within your own teams. And, and as leaders, we absolutely have to be aware, aware of the dynamics of what happen, is happening in our teams. Otherwise, we can't be leading them. Yes. You know? Well, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. So that's the end of me talking to these guys. And now it's the chance for uh, all of you who would like to ask any questions. Um, if, if anybody here has got a question. Hello, uh, George from Webbro. So I've got, I've got a question on diversity. Because it's, I, don't, I don't know how easy it is to answer, but if you look at the, the way current things are, there's a lot more men in the industry. So naturally, there can be a lot more men with experience. And just keeping this to gender, because obviously I appreciate there's, there's other factors, but how do you then give these women the opportunity? Because if you're applying for higher level jobs, there are so many more men available than women in the pot. So do you kind of say, right, diversity needs to take priority? Do you say, suitability needs to make take priority because yeah there may well be women are, that are the most suitable but when you're looking at say 50 men to 20 women the odds are the man is going to be more suitable so how do you then make the right choice what, what is the right choice that's I mean th this is a question which is very fair because it's linked to do you positively discriminate is really yeah. the, is, is the other side of that so perhaps Karen I could ask you to answer that one first yeah, and I think this is where the potential bit comes in. So, so for us that are looking at those typically more early in career, so I appreciate you asking about from a leadership point of view, and that's where the investment comes, that actually if you do hire from the start because there is a limited pool, you have got this problem at that leadership level where actually if organisations invested more now because females are staying as well as males on our programme, that they are now starting to get to that leadership position. And we're finding there's about 33% um, of our graduates, for example, are female, about 25% in our apprenticeship pool. And I think it is because when you get to that leadership level, you are asking for experience, whereas at that early stage, um, like I mentioned before, we're not asking for CVs, we don't ask for experience. So we're finding that there is no change as you go through that process. And when you're at that assessment centre, there is no still discrimination at that um, level. And there is a bit to say, if we're doing that at an early career, is there any reason you have to do that later on, depending on what that leadership role is? How technical do you need to be when you get into some of those leadership roles? You know, it's that whole traditional, isn't it? You're good technically, are you good at a leader kind of kind of piece? So I think there's something around what shifts it, but I think this is where also things like women 
um, returner programmes come in um, where people have been out and then you bring those females back in who maybe want to change careers. I think there's also things like um, other government programmes that's worth looking into as well, that like this skills boot camps and encouraging. So I was talking to an organisation this week that are um, brought in about a thousand people on this skills boot camp and they're various ages. Again, they're not just young people, it's people wanting to reskill later on and they, they're bringing in like 50% females. So I think it's looking at different avenues to that. But I don't know, I know you're talking doing broader mm-hmm. recruitment, whether you've got a specific yeah. example from a leadership perspective. <laughs> I mean, I think when you're entering the industry as an installation technician, for us, we're not looking at previous skills. We're looking at um, very few skills you need to have, which is obviously positivity is huge. We are looking for drive and we're looking for people that are physically capable to do the job. Um, Women are physically capable to do the job. I think it has been a misconception in the past where people have thought, you know, it's a heavy role of... um, rope for instance like they can't carry it and we're very firm in our wording which is like unless a a female has asked you for help you don't need to help them it's it's not the gentlemanly thing to do to go and grab a big heavy piece of machinery from a woman because they're a woman like that's not acceptable to us for us it's more of like accepting women and what they bring to the table um our splices some of our most talented splices are women um they are female so for us it's utilizing those skills in the right ways Thanks for that. But I think this question was more about not when you bring people in to start with, it's as you're getting further up, and it's the leaky pipe you were talking about. Yeah, so I would, um, I'd kind of turn the premise of the question around. The premise of the question was, there's, there's a guy who can do the job, right? Now, I, one of the things I love about this industry is that we rarely work alone might have an office but i am constantly working in teams and as a leader when i'm putting teams together i want to know what the dynamic of that team is and so if you have a team which is all men right and you're looking for someone to fill a role within that team and there's a woman that can do that role well then, I would be looking at the dynamics of the team. What is the gender mix? What's the diversity mix? What's the mix between the detail orientated and the big picture people? So the premise that there's one role and one guy, because of the way the industry works in teams, I think good leaders look at team dynamics and making sure that there's a mix and diversity of the ways of thinking. Any more questions? Nope. Uh, thank you. I'll introduce myself. It's Paul Smith, um, retired Virgin Media O2 at some stage or other. You've talked very much about female and male roles. Where does the LGBTQ plus come into the equation? Yeah. Um, I don't want to use the word manage or cope, but where does it sit within that piece? Okay, well I'd like to start that one uh, with Rasheen. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I do for Corny is I coach and mentor women. And the reason I do that is because I'm 52 years old. I started 32 years ago in the industry and I have been in a 10% minority all my life. And as a young woman, I kind of spent far too many years being a certain way, like to fit in somehow. Like, you know, I was surrounded by men, so I was kind of, oh yeah, I can, you know, I can swear as much as the next man, I can do, you know, all of that. What I understood as I got through my career is that you can't really fully commit to a job you're doing if you can't be authentically yourself, right? So whatever that is, whatever is authentic to you. For me, it's about being a woman. So I spent a very long time going on training courses that were given by men for men and sat there thinking, I don't really think this kind of works for me. 
without the confidence to say, yeah, this, this doesn't work for me because I think in a different way, I work in a different way. Similarly with LGBTQ+, similarly with um, religious beliefs or with... Um, ethnic diversity. Ethnic diversity with cultural differences. You have to be able to allow your staff to bring their full selves to work. What, in, in however they express themselves. So long as that doesn't, as long as that doesn't damage the people around them, um, and being LGBTQ+, um, it, at work doesn't affect whether you can splice or not. It doesn't affect your ability to figure out what a digital signal processor is. Um, but hey, welcome them allow them to be themselves in in the environment that you create for them that's that's how i would see it yeah Tamron? i fully agree i mean we we don't ask our employees to bring their best self to work that's not something we've ever asked it's bring your whole self so that means whatever you're going through whoever you are bring yourself to work um and and speak about it so we've had discussions with um, all sorts of people and we're, we're trying to bring this in where it's discussions where we discuss hardships and how we um, how like influential people overcame it so we had a um, a roaming team that had won um, the female class uh, for roaming across the Atlantic they came in and they spoke about I think it was determination and perseverance and how they pushed through and we've had things where we celebrate um, Pride Month. So we had a team get together where our CEO and our COO, we all were sitting and painting and discussing LGBTQ and discussing, you know, what it means to people. And that was, we did that alongside one of um, our technicians that is LGBTQ. And she came in and she said, let's do something to celebrate it that's positive. Um, and that's what we did. And we had um, quite a lot of people join us. We celebrate other things um, like Black History Month, um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We celebrate um, all of this as a, as a company. Um, and that's just something that we've done to be able to bring everybody in. Um, and yeah, that's just what we do. Thanks. And Karen? Yeah, so we, um, we went to Stonewall and actually that was put together um, with, by one of our graduates um, alongside a part of one of our diversity groups that specialises um, in, in that diversity. We have lots of different diversity groups. Um, so that was a great example of that equity lens that we talk a lot about at VMO2 around other people's views, different perspectives. So there's definitely something internally in some of the things mm -hmm. you've talked about. We also, from um, an attraction point of view, we ensure that um, when we're doing anything like blogs, for example, or videos, TikToks, whatever it might be, um, that we have representation from lots of different diverse groups. Because like you say, there's those pieces you can do once you're in, but it's people looking at your website, for example, how mm -hmm. you communicate, how you sell yourself to go, is this for me? Will I feel included? Yeah. So we do a lot of the upfront stage as well as once they're in the organisation. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Any more questions? Hi, yeah. Um, James Harwood from Virgin Media Road 2. Um, mine's around kind of skill development and thinking kind of future careers is normally a longer term investment, both from a planning point, the duration of the, the kind of programme that they're on. How do we tackle a change in skill during that period? So if we was to onboard someone or plan for an apprenticeship, and their role is less re relevant during that, you know, training journey. What are we doing to make sure we're always kind of future proofing the programs, even the ones that are running currently? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the first thing I could ask is like, are you listening to the employee? Is it something that they're interested still in doing? Obviously, the the role might not necessarily be fully relevant, but I'm sure you could adapt the role to be able to be relevant to the company. If they're not interested in the role anymore, what are they interested in? Are you having those conversations with them? Are you looking at um, bringing in extra training for them and giving them the extra skills to close the gaps for them to reach their goals and reach their dreams? Um, I hope I answered your question. But yeah, what are, what are you doing in that side, which is understanding and listening um, and having those conversations and also future thinking. If it's a, a skill that's not going to be around for long, why are we hiring for it right now? You know, it's it's those things, and if we can see the decline, where can we bridge those gaps? Karen? Yeah, I agree with that. I think, to your point around that long-term investment, the amount of effort it takes to actually create a really good apprenticeship programme mm -hmm. can take 
you know, many months to put together. So you don't really want that to find that a few months later, we've decided that skill set is irrelevant. I think for us, we try and have broad apprenticeship programs in the organisation. But one of the things that we have started doing, which um, again is equity, we talk very heavily about that. So you used to have graduate programmes, and um, we still have those graduate programmes. And they, they are traditionally, they rotate, you'll do four, six month typical rotations. You get a very broad base to that point you can almost quite you can change those skills as you're going if you needed to what we've introduced in the last couple of years is that we've got our, our apprenticeship programs so again that they're getting more of that um breadth for moving that ability to move around because i think that's what's going to be increasingly important that internal mobility to your point around having that flexibility to change i think the downside in some ways of apprenticeships is you've still got to to complete that qualification you've still got to have the evidence for that particular skill set. So if you wanted to go into cyber security, you wouldn't be evidencing that if you suddenly decide you want to be a network engineer, but the breadth in those roles is is pretty mm -hmm. big. Um, but yeah, that's, that is the key bit to almost go, where do we think things are going to decline? Yeah. Where are things going to increase? Is this too narrow or is this going to be fit for purpose for at least 18 to 24 months, which is typically how long those, those schemes are? Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, so I mentor, like I say in Corning, a lot of, um, a lot of young people that are coming through the business and I think um, we've heard from the business side you know not ideal if we're bringing people in and we suddenly discovered that, that we have no use for their role but one of the things that I do on an individual basis is I encourage the people that I work with to write their own script so I use this analogy of, I'm sure we've all heard of actors and they, they write this hit film and people say, you know, how did this come about? And they say, well, I couldn't get a job as an actor. So I decided to write a script and give myself the starring role, right? And I encourage young people to think about that in, in the jobs that they're doing and, and say, you know, if you've got space, write the script. So... If you're doing an analytics job, um, right, think about how you can expand that role to get more skills. And I think, so for instance, say you're doing an analysis job and you're looking at data and putting it into BI. Well, okay, do you know how to, how to create your own dashboards in BI? Do you know how to write the macro scripts to make this job easier? expand the role so that so that if individuals do find themselves in positions where maybe they're they're, they're not get, being utilized enough that those individuals are empowered to start writing their own script expand the role into things that are useful so this is a this is like a call not only to employers to encourage skills, it's for employees to be oh, proactive yeah. about uh, expanding their possibilities. Yeah. Don't mm -hmm. expect it to come on a plate. Exactly. You can go and yeah. go and ask for it. Yeah. Which very much again comes back down to what uh, the guys at Barn were saying, along with bring people in and skill them up. Now with that, I'm afraid we've gone slightly over, but we're almost at four o'clock. So I would like to say thank you very much to the panelists, Karen, Tamron and Roshin, and thank you very much to all of the audience participation. Thank you. Thank you.